Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Sarah Pate, and I'm the director of the Washington Center for the Book, an affiliate of the Library of Congress Center for the Book, administered by Washington State Library. And I'm also a librarian at the Washington State Library. The Washington Center for the Book promotes literacy and a love of books, reading, and libraries. We celebrate Washington's robust literary heritage and shine a spotlight on the contribution of reading and libraries in strengthening communities and in fostering civic engagement. Today, we are thrilled to be celebrating the newly added recordings to the historic and still living and still breathing Palabra Archive of the Library of Congress. Specifically, we are here to celebrate the five Washington State authors who were recently added to this collection of online recordings. The Palabra Archive is a collection of original audio recordings of 20th and 21st century Luso-Hispanic poets and writers reading from their works, with recorded authors from all over Latin America, the Iberian Peninsula, the Caribbean, and other regions with Hispanic and Portuguese heritage populations. This archive has to date close to 800 recordings, a portion of which are available for online streaming. Partnering with Catalina Gomez, reference librarian and curator for the Palabra Archive, the Washington Center for the Book helped to identify, contact, and facilitate new recordings with authors Kathleen Alcala, Claudia Castro Luna, Carlos Gil, Kristen Miares Young, and Dona Mescolta. And I want to say a spe special thank you to Linda Johns of the Seattle Public Library, who is here with us today in the audience, who suggested many of these wonderful authors. Thank you, Linda. These new recordings, some of which were recorded at the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library with the help of John Pye, who is also here with us today, were released online earlier this fall. So first up, I would like to welcome Catalina Gomez of the Library of Congress to tell us a bit about the Palabra Archive, its history, and her connection to it. Welcome, Catalina. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Linda, so much for um, inviting me, uh, for reaching out to me, uh, and for this great collaboration. Uh, I am Catalina Gomez. I'm a librarian in the Library of Congress Hispanic Reading Room and the curator of the Palada Archive. And um, I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation and to celebrate um, this great partnership that uh, the Library of Congress and the Washington Center for the Book um, embarked on to identify poets and writers to record for this very historic collection. Um, so um, just a little bit of brief history about the Palabra Archive. Um, this is a collection that was founded in, um, in the early 1940s at, at the library. Uh, in the early 40s, it was the dawn of um, audio recording um, in magnetic tape technology. That, that magnetic tape was very new in the early 40s. And this is when a lot of um, um, you know, audio archives, uh, the practice of audio archiving became um, very prominent at the Library of Congress. It was also a decade where um, literature and poetry were extremely, extremely in the forefront of the Library of Congress because the director of the library back then was um, the American poet Archibald MacLeish. And so um, there was a sort of renaissance of literature and poetry back then. And so these collections began to emerge. Uh, and you know, these, this practice of recording the audio of live readings uh, with very prominent poets and writers that would be at the library, as well as intimate uh, sessions in the recording lab. Uh, began in, in this time at the Library of Congress. Uh, I'm very happy to say that the Hispanic Room has continued this tradition and we're still um, keeping this wonderful project alive and we're still recording as many poets and prose writers that we can uh, that represent uh, the regions that Sarah mentioned. So Latin America, the Caribbean, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, so Spain and Portugal, uh, as well as um, other regions uh, that have had Hispanic or Portuguese heritage. And, um, and obviously one of those is, um, you know, the really, really important and large commu uh, Hispanic community in the United States. And for us, um, this group is very important in the archive because the library is uh, the American National Library. And um, there is, as you all know, uh, a very important heritage um, or you know, multiple heritages that represent uh, the Hispanic, uh, Latino, Hispanic, Latinx 
um, contributions. And so these collaborations with uh, state centers for the book is something that we wanted to, to, to do because um, we, by, by sort of uh, casting a wider net and being able to, to uh, rely on these centers who are so, so well uh, informed with the sort of the po po poetry and literary scene uh, in their states, in, in their cities. Uh, we really wanted to tap into this. And so um, I think deep in the pandemic, we had a meeting with all the state centers for the book and um, Sarah and Linda were there and we met with, um, with um, you know, members from all the different state centers of the book. And we, we, um, we presented about this archive and we expressed this great desire that we had to, to collaborate. Uh, and um, Sarah and Linda were the first ones to to eagerly reply to me, and um, and it was such a successful project. Um, and all these incredible poets and writers that you see here today were identified by uh, Sarah and Linda, and we coordinated both virtual and in-person recordings, um, which was fantastic. Uh, we gave each of you the option to either do a virtual recording because obviously we have the technology to do that today but um there was also a wonderful opportunity to do recordings in the in in the um, sorry the the braille library in in yeah. seattle the washington talking book yes. and braille library with tobble it for short <laughs> yes and so some of some of you decided to to do this in person in the recording lab which was fantastic and so um i'm just thrilled and um, yeah, the, the archive today uh, contains close to 850 recordings. Uh, every year we upload 50 recordings uh, online. So we're gradually uh, uploading and publishing uh, recordings uh, on our website. Um, a lot of this collection is analog. And so we've been working to digitize a lot of these tapes uh, and um, we, yeah, we um, hope that we can continue growing this collection. We, can, we hope that we can continue uh, collaborating with you, Sarah and Linda, and con continue to record more uh, Seattle-based um, poets and writers. And it's such an honor to be here with all of you. You guys are all incredible uh, writers, and I'm just thrilled that this was such a success. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Catalina. Uh, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our wonderful authors to you one by one, and I will turn it over to each of them to start the conversation by talking about what it means for them to have their work included in this archive and what their recording experience was like. So first up, Kathleen Alcala is the author of six books of fiction and nonfiction. Her work has received the Western States Book Award, the Governor's Writing Writers Award, and a Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association Book Award. She received her second Artist Trust Fellowship in 2008, and in 2014 was honored by the National Latino Writers Group, Continta. She has been designated an island treasure in the arts on Bainbridge Island, and her novel, The Flower in the Skull, will be republished by Raven Chronicles Press in 2023. Kathleen, welcome. Can you start us off? Thank you, Sarah. Yes, I wanted to re-emphasize that I'm so happy, Catalina, to be included with Carlos, Claudia, Kristen, Donna, um, and thank you, Sarah, for being a big part of this. And to John Pai, who was so patient. It turned out that um, I did my recording during the pandemic at the library, and um, for some reason it wasn't turned on. The mic wasn't turned on. So I had to re record uh, my part. Um, you know, I've been thinking about this and um, remember that a long time ago I had. Um, written an essay about literacy called Reading the Signs, and so I'd like to read you two short paragraphs out of it. An ideal exercise in literacy for me would be that this, a young man reading one of my stories in a high school literature class. He goes on to order one of my books and sees that it's also available on tape. What's more, it is available on tape in Spanish, so he orders a copy for his grandmother who has cataracts and no longer reads. By listening to this tape, the grandmother would complete the circle of my work. 
since the first stories I heard were from my aunts and were told in Spanish. The stories remind the grandmother of stories she knows, and she tells them to her grandson, who posts one or two on his website. Quote, I am compelled to continue in my family's legacy to demonstrate an obdurate sensitivity to the nat natural world, says Warm Springs, Wasco Navajo poet Elizabeth Woody. This sense of place is an instruction that upholds an honorable way of life. I am active in my art by giving story, by observing and listening. My parents, aunties and uncles have reinforced this, especially the need to nurture the land through loves, through love. And that's from my essay collection, um, The Desert Remembers My Name. And so I really have this sense of the library itself by recording voices telling the stories, uh, taking that, uh, taking the whole thing full circle so that we come back to the oral tradition. Thank you so much, Kathleen. So Claudia Castro Luna is an Academy of American Poets Poet Laureate Fellow 2019, Washington State Poet Laureate from 2018 to 2021, and Seattle's inaugural civic poet from 2015 to 2018. Born in El Salvador, she came to the United States in 1981. Living in English and Spanish, Claudia writes and teaches in Seattle on unceded Duwamish lands where she gardens and keeps chickens with her husband and their three children. Welcome, Claudia. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Sarah. It is such a huge honor to join this room this morning. I echo what has been said by Kristen and Kathleen and Carlos and Donna, um, how significant uh, it is. Um, and, you know, I extend my gratitude to Linda Johns and Sarah Pate for recommending us um to Catalina to join the archive I, I think this is easily the biggest honor of my life to for my work to be recorded and to live in the amazing library which I've had the opportunity to visit and was just arrested in awe uh and to think that you know that my words and my voice are stored there is just an amazing amazing thing to to think about and consider um, I, I was born in El Salvador um, to teachers. My parents were teachers. My mom taught me to read and write by the time I was four years old. And uh, being teachers, my parents assured that there were books and stories that I could turn to. Um, by the time I was 10 years old, I saw my first library. There were no public libraries in the town that I grew up, Un Pueblito, a very small village really when I was there um, in western El Salvador and so my first in visual uh, taken of a library was um, in 10th grade and I was hooked um, so I became an avid reader and an avid library collector and um, one of the joys of living in the United States is that we have amazing libraries to visit and to borrow all the books that we may want. So again, that the idea that somebody could walk into the library and um, you know listen to me tell these poems about my life in El Salvador is an amazing thing. Um, the significance of this moment is both hugely personal for me as a child immigrant who came to the U.S. escaping war um, with not a word of English when I was 14 years old and a sophomore in high school to um, becoming the laureate of a state, the poet laureate of a state, to, to now having my work recorded um, at the Library of Congress. And so on the one hand is this personal moment, and in the other hand is this also a moment of really, I think, a transcendental moment. When my family came to the U.S., nobody knew anything about Salvadorans. Um, the iconic food of our pupusas was unheard of. And in the, you know, 40 plus years that I've lived in this country, you cannot arrive in a major city in the U.S. without finding a, a pupuseria. Salvadorans are everywhere. 
And the fact that there is a Salvadoran now recorded in the Palabra archive who is living in the United States is uh, a moment of acknowledgement that we are here, that Salvadorans are part of the American um, experiment, that we are part of America's history. And it's just a moment to think that from, you know, 45 years ago, not being reflected back in any way in this country to now where we see ourselves more and more um, into this moment is really an amazing thing. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Hopefully down the line, I'll, I'll be able to share a poem. But again, thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Carlos Gil. After his retirement from the University of Washington, Professor Gil published, We Became, American, we Became Mexican American, How Our Family Survived to Pursue the American Dream. A biography of his family emphasizing the social and cultural adjustments his immigrant family experienced. It is a tale of American immigration from the South. More recently, Professor Heal has continued to teach various aspects of Latin America and Latino studies via the Osher Institute at UW and the Humanities Washington office. He is also president of the Latino Development Organization, serving Latinos at the Monroe Correctional Complex. Carlos, welcome, and thank you for being with us here today. And Carlos, you're still muted. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Catalina, for having invited me. And as Sarah has uh, said so already, I've basically spent most of my life uh, studying Latin America, Mexico specifically. And I did so because both my mom and dad and my grandma and my uncles and so on, they had all crossed the border back in the 19-teens, 1920s. And uh, they arrived uh, just a few years before the Great Depression. And so um, I, I'm the fourth of eight children born in Southern California. And I was the first to uh, graduate from high school. And um, luckily I'm writing that now, trying to kind of explore my mind about it. But I was able to break the mold, so to speak, in my little barrio of San Fernando, California. And I broke the mold in graduating from high school and then finally going to college and then eventually uh, getting a PhD many, many years later. But all of my intellectual attention has been paid to Latin America and to my experience as a member of a Mexican American family or as a member of a Mexican immigrant family. And it's after I finished at the University of Washington, I decided to take advantage of some tapes that I had recorded back in the 1970s of my mom, my uncles, the older people in my family. They're all gone now, they're all gone. But I was able to put together this book that, um, that I've mentioned, that Sarah mentioned, we became Mexican American. And it's a book about how hard it was for us to come to America and to become Americanized. It's the tale of immigration, the kinds of uh, thoughts, the kinds of experiences that are usually not captured in history books, because history books tend to look at things from a very high observational level. I come down to the level of the family, the, the level of us, us kids, and especially the women in my family. The women in my family suffered a lot because of the cultural clashes involved in 
becoming Americanized. And my book goes into that, and I'm so happy that I was able to capture that uh, in our experience. So uh, again, I, I thank Catalina, and I thank uh, Sarah, and uh, Linda John for having allowed me to be able to um, promote the experiences that we underwent, which are experiences for almost any immigrant person who arrives in the United States to this day. Thank you, Carlos. Kristen Miaris Young is the author of the novel Subduction, named a staff pick by the Paris Review, called Whip Smart by the Washington Post, and quote, brilliant debut by the Seattle Times. Her essays, reviews, stories, and investigations appear in the Washington Post, Literary Hub, The Guardian, and The Rumpus, to name a few, as well as the anthologies Alone Together, Love, Grief, and Comfort in the Time of COVID-19, which won a 2021 Washington State Book Award in general nonfiction, Latina Outsiders, Remaking Latina Identity, and Advanced Creative Nonfiction, A Writer's Guide and Anthology. She is the editor of Seismic Seattle City of Literature, a 2021 Washington State Book Award finalist in creative nonfiction. Kristen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I don't think it's any accident that it is women who are attending to this collective memory that we have. Carlos, I appreciate your, um, your noticing and holding space for how women hold uh, the collective in a way that is often unrecognized because so much of our individual efforts happen in private or within only the purview of a family. And to me, you know, growing up into the digital age, what I have seen is that the commons has basically begun to be privatized on every single sector and digital recordings are no exception from that. Uh, I don't know if any of you have tried to build a library of music that, that becomes yours. Things become free and then they're taken out of that. And they recommend algorithmically other things you may like, but you can't get to the source of what brought you to there in the first place. And so the idea that what we have contributed will remain part of the public commons, that it is something that belongs to all of us and that will always belong to us and belong to the future collective that we cannot even truly envision at this time is so momentous that it uh, it really does, it did strike me with awe and I continue to be so grateful uh, that my voice will be part of this. I mean, so many of the earlier contributors going back to 43, I didn't know that these existing uh, recordings were available to me. And so I began listening to them and, you know, hearing Garcia Marquez, hearing, you know, Gabriel Mistral, like hearing all of these people that I worshipped. I worshipped their books and I worshipped their library books because my undergraduate uh, education was so expensive that I uh, basically got most of my books from the library. And so I returned those books to the library and the fact that what I touched is now been touched by so many other peoples, but now I can access their voices through this uh, collective that I can bring with me at any time. Um, and that my voice and all the voices here are blended among those becoming this chorus is something that is beyond a reckoning that I can truly take in. I think I'll have to you know, mature into this understanding over time. And so for my recording, you know, um, We've living through a plague, right? It's terrible. <laughs> and so I thought very hard about, you know, what I might contribute. And of course, I, you know, I read an excerpt from my novel because I spent, you know, a decade of research and writing that book. But and I'm I, I love that book uh, and, and its explorations. And but at the same time, just the now, what we have been through, what we are continually going through right now is something that is of interest to future generations and can be. Uh, instructive, I hope, in creating a better community of care. And if we ourselves are not able to meet this moment with care and response, then perhaps others who hear our voices will learn from what we did and did not do in this time and can act as a, a healer uh, over time. And so that is my hope, that these voices, that our voices, our contributions will create a healing around not only uh, what it is to be an American, uh, but also what it is to live through a time that tests what you know about what it means to be part of a collective. 
And I think that Latinos, particularly, we have something to offer here. We have provided so much service. We have provided so much care that has gone unrecognized and unheralded. And for the fact that the federal government now is investing in our voices as a canon is meaningful. It's meaningful that it is enshrined for the future. It's meaningful that our care and our thoughts are being carried forward. And for that, I really uh, thank Linda Johns for recommending my inclusion, Sarah Pate uh, for uh, stewarding us through this process, and Catalina for really invigorating this archive, right? Because archives are can go fallow, right? And every field must lie fallow to remain fertile. And yet to bring it into the current moment, right? To bring it and enrich it with our voices um, is a beautiful stewardship to the future. So I thank you all. Thank you, Kristen. Donna Miskolta is the author of three books of fiction, When the De, De La Cruz Family Dance, Hola and Goodbye, Una Familia de In Stories, and Living Color, Angie Rubio Stories, a finalist for the 2021 Washington State Book Award for Fiction and winner of the International Latino Gold Medal Award for Best Collection of Short Stories. Donna was born in San Diego and grew up in National City, California, she received a bachelor's degree in zoology from San Diego State and later received master's degrees in education and public administration from the University of Washington. During the 30 years that she worked as a project manager in local government, she took classes and workshops in fiction writing. She lives in Seattle. Donna, thank you for being with us here today. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Catalina and Linda, who's not here. And it's a great honor to be here among my friends, Claudia, Kristen, Kathleen, and Carlos. And thank you for all your brilliant words. And it's always a challenge to follow Kristen's brilliance <laughs> so and beauty. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, what does it mean to be part of this? Well, it's just amazing. Um, it's a great honor. It's, I like um, Claudia said. It's an, the honor of my life, really. Most writers are not household names. Most of us don't have national exposure or recognition. We exist in bubbles of varying sizes, and we have something published. We experience a little surge of attention before we return to our normal lives of, of obscurity, where we continue to write and send out our work and get rejections and sometimes acceptances because that's what we do, that's the nature of writing. And while it's true that writing is its own reward, we also write to be read and to be heard. But that's not something that's always within our control and we wonder where our work will, our work will reside in years to come. And it's so great to know that now our work will reside in the Library of Congress, Congress Palabra Archive. It's such an incredible honor to have my work live in the archive among my, the work of my friends here and all the other writers before us. Um, and when I, so when I got the email from Catalina, it was just so great. And when she, uh, we were offered the option to either do a call or go to a recording studio. I've been used to sequestering during the pandemic and staying in my own apartment was more appealing. And um, so Sarah was on the call with Catalina and I think Linda was too. So I had a little bit of an, bit of an audience, which is always helpful when you're reading your work, um, but I couldn't see them. So it just felt like I was still sort of alone in this little space reading my work. And um, it's difficult for me to read without stumbling over words now and again, and sometimes more than now and again. And so I was concerned about what I felt within many stumbles during this recording. But um, Catalina assured me that the stumbles just reflected the humanness of the experience. So my humanness is on generous display in this recording, I think. And one day when my grandchildren listen to my voice, they will hear all that humanness. So thank you so much for this honor. It's, it's hard to put in words what it really means. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Catalina. Thank you, Donna. Okay, so on to my next question for everyone. And that is, how did you choose the piece or pieces that you recorded? And um, Claudia, I'm gonna start with you. 
let me unmute myself. Um, well, I read mostly from my latest book, uh, which was, I, I read from, uh, uh, the book was not yet, yet published, he put that under the moon, but it was already on its way. Um, and the reason why I did that was because this is the most personal book I've written. It really traces the story of my family living in El Salvador as the civil war broke out, the worst of the civil war, and our eventual escape and arrival into the U.S. And our, this is a history that a lot of people don't know. In my travels throughout Washington State and elsewhere, I meet young people born here, Salvadorans now born in the United States, who are unaware of this history. And partly, um, or, or in great part, a reason for this is that their parents um, are traumatized. There is a lot of trauma around uh, those terrible years of the war, which in my opinion is still to an extent happening. Um, and it's very hard to go back and relive these stories of, of war. Um, and so my effort in writing this book was to document this um, history, the Salvadoran history of the Civil War and how it triggered this great exodus of Salvadorans who are now the fourth largest Latino group in the United States. There's millions of us living in the diaspora, not just here, but in other countries across the world. And I and I was, I witnessed this war. I was there. And so this book um, is, a, is, a, is very personal in that I had to go back and, and relive um, those moments, those terrifying moments. It's also an effort because I was a child then to um, talk about childhood experiences of, of trauma. Um, at that scale, so war and state violence. Um, children are centered throughout the book. And yeah, that's the reason why I mostly read from the book. I'll read a very short poem that, that tells the story the day that my family arrived in Miami, um, our first day in the US. And the poem also talks about the importance that writing has played in my life. And it's titled Cloven Moon. The officer in charge of processing my family's entrance to the United States stated that from that moment on, my name was to be Claudia Castro. The passport says her name is Claudia Castro Luna, my mother objected. Here we only used one name, said the officer, and closed the matter with the gavel of his voice. Your moon got taken away from you, my friend said when I recounted the story. But when the officer eclipsed the luna of my name, the sensation was more like having a limb chopped off. For years, I walked like that, cloven, until pen in hand, I began to weave into blank pages tamales de lote, scent of yerba buena, spells of flor del muerto, the riot of a Tuesday market in Huachapang, the Nahuatl sageness of my abuela. I did not know then that weaving like this, warp of memory, weft of daring, had the power to sew back the name chopped off at an INS center on a January morning in 1981. All I know is that one day I walked into a social security office, took a number, and waited for my turn to expand the canon of last names in this country. I pilgrimaged the Department of Motor Vehicles, registrar's offices, bank teller windows, and once La Luna hung again in the firmament of my name, its light spilled beneath my skin and filtered back into the world from the open mouths of a million pores. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Claudia, beautiful. Um, Kristen, how did you um, choose your selections that, that you put in the archive? Well, you know, part of me uh, wanted to contribute that which had already been tested, right? And so, um, for example, just listening to Claudia's beautiful poem right there, you see, you know, the eye of revision over it again and again, and it is so beautiful to watch that moon rise in such careful hands. 
Um, but I actually, for the closing hour of my, or the closing uh, 25 minutes of my hour long performance, I contributed an essay that had not been published called Brainstorm that I wrote while on a medically induced pandemic road trip uh, during May of 2020, a time when I was actually on tour for subduction. And I didn't tell anyone, I didn't want people to know that I wasn't at my house. So I didn't tell anyone that I was literally crossing the country and made it from Seattle to St. Louis to uh, care for my mother-in-law who had gone through a bout of temporary global amnesia. Um, and I left, I got the call on Friday morning at 9 a.m. We left at, by noon, uh, fully packed with my children, which parents will know is a feat. Uh, and by Monday at 2 p.m., I was giving a virtual event for uh, a bookstore in Pittsburgh, <laughs> unshowered, but in full makeup, right? And, uh, but seeing that, seeing the, going through America and seeing the traces of the pioneer wagons in the, you can still see the ruts in the clay, right? Like seeing all of these people unmasked, uh, not worrying about where their hands had been um, around each other, really challenged and uh, me to think about what it means uh, to be um, in community and whether I considered some of these other people that I was seeing who I felt were acting carelessly, could I claim them as my people? And realizing, um, James Baldwin talks about this. He said, you go down the street of a city and you see the disaffection in people's faces and you realize that that is you. What you're looking at is yourself. And so reckoning with what I was seeing in the landscape and the people around me as a journey through the own schisms of my family and our uh, assimilation to this country, um, that's how I, I closed out uh, the recording. Um, I'd like to uh, read a small section of the letter that I opened it with, uh, which is a letter to fellow pandemic survivors, given that um, those who will be listening to this uh, have the great fortune of being descended perhaps by those from those who, who did survive. Or if they are the children of those who passed, uh, they will hold the grief and trauma that you're referring to, Claudia, for all of us in a way that uh, we sometimes wish to erase uh, because uh, there's nothing America likes better than amnesia, right? Uh, it helps uh, allow for the furtherance of capitalism that is uh, a devastation upon the land and our people. Um, so, uh, quote, the unendurable is the beginning of the curve of joy, end quote. This Juna Barnes quote is the epigraph to Lacey Johnson's The Reckonings, a notion which seems apropos. Unfortunately, whenever I see the curve now, I think flatten. This is the fourth version of this letter that I've created. The first three took morbid turns, and I do so want to bring us round to the joy, which is more than a privilege. Joy is a radical act. Joy is a wellspring. Joy enlivens us to do the work. Joy is rebellion. Spring arrived. Cyclically, I become so restless that I have trouble focusing, which usually isn't my problem. Making time to write and yet not producing induces in me a panic that can only be quieted with new pages. I must crack the casing of that which has held me in keeping. Growth. Irritable for the sun, I am possessed by a yearning for the mountains, visible now that the cloud layer has lifted if only for a few weeks. Have you ever watched a bulb sprout on Fast Forward? On screens, I have seen the tender shoots rupture the bulb and reach for the sky, waving back and forth with elapsed time. Reader, I tell you that my acanthus flowers poked their green stalks to the loam just before a spring snowstorm. The next day, Seattle Hills became sled runs. My neighbors emerged from their homes, masks on, sleds out, and went for it, really went for it, down streams we blocked off with cones. I made a snowman, I mean a snow pyramid really, because I never learned how to roll a ball of snow, and I watched a pit pack of kids take it out. The acanthus endured the storm. I wasn't sure they would. During the melt, I watched with their bent stalks, imagined bruised petals. That which had been flattened did rise. Those white flowers are with me even now. Driven to distraction, I watch the graphs intersect. One for vaccinations, the other for cases. I'm hoping so hard it hurts. By the time you read this letter, the visible parts of my acanthus will have scattered themselves into the soil. Our season of waiting will have begun. Not all nurture brings comfort. We will spend the rest of our lives shadowed by this epoch. Our end has been forestalled, but not avoided. To honor the fallen to whom we are indebted, we who draw breath have work to do. Ahora nunca. Put care, 
at the center of your days, for each other, for the earth, for a future which is ours to glimpse once and relinquish to memory. Palante. In gratitude for our shared endeavor, I remain yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. Carlos, can you tell us um, how you chose the pieces, the selections from your book that you added to the archive? And um, you're muted. Sorry about that. So um, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, most of my writings have been about uh, uh, Latin America and then our family coming to Southern California. And so I was born and raised in a barrio, a real barrio that existed on the other side of the tracks in Southern California. And so that barrio uh, is no longer there. In many ways, it's uh, been erased by uh, by many changes in Southern California. And so what I did is that I tried to preserve using what I would call word pictures of what our world was like at the level of the barrio. And so um, one of the sections that I um, read from uh, is called Kalisher Street. And it uh, refers to uh, the church that we... Uh, uh, belonged and um, participated in. It re it identifies and describes the little tienditas that used to sell carne para tacos, carne de res, uh, carne para albondigas, that kind of thing. Uh, and I even include the cantinas that were part of our barrio life for a lot of single men who lived side by side uh, with our families uh, there in, in my hometown of San Fernando. I also describe another part that I call La Vecindad. And La Vecindad uh, describes these tiny apartments where we lived when we were growing up. Two room apartments, a bedroom and a kitchen. And that's where our family began to uh, grow. And so those kinds of things are really precious memories to keep. And believe it or not, many of these are still there. Another uh, section that I read uh, is called Grandma's Tortilla Shop. And in that section, in that part of the book, I basically describe the tortilla and how corn tortillas were made, handmade, using old metates and old manos and comales and all those kinds of things that you no longer see. And so that's part of the um, part of the readings that I did. The other part that I uh, want to mention as well is my intending to set in stone, so to speak, of the travails that we underwent to stay alive. Uh, one of the sections that is really dear to my heart is my describing our going up north. And so this refers to the hundreds and hundreds of families who traveled from LA in our area up to Delano, up to uh, San Jose when it was a small city, up to uh, um, uh, all those towns up that, uh, Cesar, that Cesar Chavez made famous. And so we used to go there before Cesar Chavez um, became a, a farm worker. And so we went along, so it was the parents and the kids going to pick peaches, harvest um, plums, harvest grapes, 
and all of that, all of the good and bad of that kind of experience. Uh, Kristen refers to um, capitalism and doing farm work today as yesterday in my book is a very good example of how capitalist exploitation really just drives and wears away at the level of the family. And so those are the parts that I read and I'm very happy again that I was able to put those down so that young people beginning with the uh, my relatives and my family, my my young, my uh, my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids. I have a bunch of them. They might appreciate what we went through, and what a lot of people are still going through today, because somebody picks our lettuce, somebody picks our grapes, and they're still going through the kinds of travail and heartache that we went through. And so I'm glad I was able to do that. Thank you so much, Carlos. Kathleen, can you tell us about your selections and, and how you made them? Yes, I love listening to Carlos talk about his background. It's um, very much like my father's background. Um, and it was the railroad that brought people north that saved their lives during the Mexican Revolution. Um, they were recruited to work for the Santa Fe and Atchison, Topeka, whatever it's called, railroad. And so ca came north. They walked north from Los Altos de Jalisco, which is in central Mexico. Um, but I did not write about that. I uh, didn't know very much about my father's stories because they were sort of overshadowed by my mother's stories, she was from a large family. Uh, my father was an only child, a single parent. And um, so when my mother's siblings got together, they told stories and they were, uh, everything was presented together. There was nothing about, well, this is made up and this is not made up. This, this was just how history was told in our family. So that was my very first book, um, Mrs. Vargas and the Dead Naturalist. And I recorded uh, the, uh, the title story um, for the archive. And I also recorded the first chapter of my first novel, Spirits of the Ordinary. Um, so one thing I didn't notice until just today when I was looking through these materials was that both the first chapter of Spirits of the Ordinary and the title story of the collection, Mrs. Vargas and the Dead Naturalists, open with women doing domestic work in their house, women doing housework. And I thought, well, that doesn't seem like a very promising place to start, you know, history books or, or fantasy books, all the sorts of things that I'm always interested in. Um, but I think I wanted to start with the mundane in each case and take the reader along to on an adventure. So I'll read you uh, just the first page or so of Mrs. Vargas. Mrs. Vargas had been cleaning the house for a week in anticipation of the visit, and the guest wasn't due for at least three more days. The hemp floor mats had been beaten and aired out, the whitewashed walls scrubbed inside and out, and Mrs. Vargas was now spreading her best embroidered tablecloth on the big square table in the sala <clears throat> while admonishing her family not to spill anything on it for the next few days. When she heard the thump on the door, she thought it was a neighbor. And then she said loudly, <clears throat> Mrs. Vargas, a short, sturdy woman, fluttered her hands over her hair as she started towards the door. The handle turned and a dusty figure half walked half fell into the front room. She had never seen him before. Dr. Ellis, she said, Dr. Ellis. Receiving no answer, she helped him to a wicker chair. The Anglo was greenish white and a cold sweat stood on his forehead and upper lip. Panting heavily, he said nothing, but looked up at her with pleading eyes. Awa, she yelled, just a minute, I'll bring you some water. And she patted him into the chair 
as though that would keep him from falling over while she went for cold water. Returning from the kitchen with her daughter, she could see that it was too late. He was slumped over and not breathing. Nevertheless, she said, Luz, go get the curandera. You, she said to her other children, attracted by the commotion. Help me put him on the bed. A leather folder fell to the floor as they carried the dusty man to the guest bedroom and laid his body on the clean cotton bedspread. So that's where the adventure starts, right there. And um, some of the things that both Kristen and um, Carlos are talking about really reminded me of a book that I'm reading right now. I don't know if you were going to ask us what we're, we're reading, Sarah, but I'm reading a book called um, Nomad Century, which talks about um, the idea that people are going to migrate. Uh, large numbers of people are migrating right now due to war and drought and um, climate change, and it's only going to get stronger. But instead of saying, oh, what shall we do? What shall we ever do? The book points out all of the positive aspects of migration, that this is how the human race has saved itself in the past, was by mass migration and by networking across large areas. And um, it's written by an anthropologist, but I thought it was a very interesting idea that really runs counter to a lot of the things that we've been hearing right now. So I think that um, much of the work that I've been doing is about change, is about migration in order to survive. One of the themes and spirits of the ordinary is um, the crypto-Judaic uh, migration from Spain to Mexico. My ancestors on that side were people who uh, had to leave Spain because they were being murdered uh, by the authorities in the name of the Inquisition. And so one at, one at a time or sometimes in groups of people, they got on ships and sailed to Mexico and made their way north as far as they could get from the authorities and started ranches and made lives for themselves. And when I first wrote this book, very little was known about it, and there was no scholarly work on it at all, but now you can see quite a bit. And many universities now have um, Sephardic studies programs as part of their Jewish studies programs. So I guess that my life and my writing has always been a convergence of all of these threads, all of these rivers coming together. And I wanted to um, just Ban a little bit of that idea with the readings that I made for the Library of Congress. So thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Donna, can you tell us about um, what you selected to add to the archive and, and why? Sure, I'll tell you about that. But first, I want to mention that um, even though Kathleen and I are of a similar age, she was a writer long before I was, and it was her book, Mrs. Vargas and the Dead Naturalist, that um, made that little voice inside me that was saying, be a writer, be a writer, to finally get me inspired to be a writer. So, so that's a story I tell often, but it's a story that I, it's dear to me. Anyway, how did I choose my pieces? I chose excerpts from the last two, my last two books of fiction. Uh, Olen Goodbye, Una Familian Stories was, was published in 2016 as a result of winning the Doris Backwin Prize for Writing by a Woman. And most of the stories in the collection, in this collection, focus on the lives of women in three generations of a family, the first of which emigrated from Mexico. And I read short excerpts that um, represented a particular challenge that these generations face, for instance, the low societal expectations of immigrants and their children, and how those like low expectations resulted in um, having those same expectations of, um, those same low expectations for themselves. Another excerpt from the book deals with the distance one of the characters feels, one of the characters of the third generation feels from um, her grandmother's country and language of origin. And the story follows her sometimes comical adventures during a summer in Mexico, taking cursos de verano, trying to connect with that past, that history um, that began with her grandmother for her family. And my most recent book is Living Color and Rubio stories about 
growing up brown as a brown girl. And I selected excerpts from two stories, the first in which Andrew discovers that she is brown. And she begins to learn what that means in terms of acceptance and belonging. And in the other story, she learns that in her school, students are separated into what are considered the smart, dumb, and in-between classes. And she observed that her class, the dumb class, is composed uh, mainly of brown kids. And so she has her own personal rebellion against this. And um, to, to finish it off, I read uh, an essay called Regeneration of the Tongue, which begins with my grandmother's arrival in the United States from Mexico and how she never learned English. She was too busy working in a fish cannery and raising seven children who were bilingual, but each of them had different proficiencies in the language. And by my generation, we were all speak, um, speaking English with Spanish in the background that we hardly paid attention to. Um, so Spanish was essentially lost. Um, but both of my daughters became fluent in, Eng uh, fluent in Spanish as a result of living in Spanish speaking countries. And now my grandchildren are receiving early exposure to the language. So Spanish has been regenerated in my family. So I thought that was a good way to end my recording because it sort of encapsulates the themes of the, the story that I read previously. Thank you so much, Donna. Uh, we are running short on time, but I do have one final question for everyone. Um, I would love to know um, what you are working on now, um, what's coming next. Um, if that is secret, um, you can maybe feel free to tell us what you're reading now if you prefer to answer that question. But if you can tell us what you're working on now or, or what's coming next, um, we'd love to hear it. Um, and uh, Donna, I'll start with you. Okay, so I just finished, um, I, I finished a, no a novel um, about large bodied twin sisters who were disaffected by their twinness, decide to go their separate ways. Um, to face the perils alone of an anti-large body um, society um, in which one sister toys with eating disorders and the other is, this is when they're in college, or they go to separate college to um, experience life without each other. And the other is assaulted as a result of a frat prank. And so it's a violation that together the, the sisters decide to avenge on their own. And the book is about sisterhood, body image, and there's also a mother-daughter dynamic um, that is part of the story as well. And uh, I just started writing another novel. Um, for the first time, I'm participating in NaNoWriMo, <laughs> in which you aim to write 50,000 words during the month of November. Yeah. And the novel I'm working on is about a set of five siblings who are all in their 60s until the eldest among them turns 70 and leads them all into another decade in the inevitable march into, into old age. So it's a story about aging, um, the passage of time, family, and what each generation leaves for the next, including their sorrows, but also small acts of heroism. Mm. Wow, thank you. Kristen, can you tell us what you're working on? Sure. Uh, I just finished a memoir called Desire Lines, uh, which pairs uh, my own tracing of my matrilineage uh, and the stories that were revealed to me only over time uh, with an investigation of this pagan mother goddess who ruled uh, pre-Christianity and throughout the Roman Empire and whose uh, power and uh, power of discernment and destruction uh, were gradually um, and then all at once uh, subverted to make her into the Virgin Mary and uh, paralleling my own matriarchs and being compelled into service that perhaps did not serve them uh, with this mother goddess uh, through, I went into many archaeological sites and uh, went into history, went into the archives. Uh, really, the Seattle Public Library has an incredible research uh, arm uh, that helped me early on uh, with that. And so um, I wrote that, and then I've um, started a, a novel uh, that is um, vexing me uh, at the moment, uh, because I don't know about the rest of you all, but when I write fiction, um, it goes so deep uh, into the being that I, I feel my way through the book. Uh, and that feeling is something that I hold in my body, but 
I hold it alone for the moment uh, because, you know, I'm writing alone. Uh, and so uh, I am also uh, trying to uh, produce a lot of pages during November, but know that it's going to take, you know, of course, uh, like you two also know, Donna, uh, it's going to take longer. Um, but I'm hopeful that uh, Desire Lines will uh, will see the light uh, pretty soon here. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Claudia, how about you? What's next? Um, well, I've been working, I have a project that I concocted and launched, which is not, it's writing related, but not my own writing, which is um, after being disillusioned with opportunities um, for um, writers who write in Spanish um, here in where I live and actually across the country, I came up with the idea of creating a writing residency for writers who write in Spanish in the United States. And I um, decided to seed, I mean, I came up with the idea and decided to seed it and um, then to find partners to make this happen because I can't run a residency on my own. So I approached a wonderful organization here in Seattle called Seattle Escribe, who has been around for at least, wow, maybe over 10 years. Maria Victoria started this organization and it's um, writers who write in Spanish, amazing writers living locally here in the Puget Sound area coming together and they've produced anthologies and meet regularly. And I pitched the idea to them um, of being the keepers of this residency that I had, that I've thought out. And I also approached a, a, an organization that does residencies to see if they would be open to this idea of holding space for an annual residency for um, Spanish-speaking writers. And that organization is Mineral School. So these two organizations didn't know each other previously, but um, we connected, the three of us, uh, me as an individual and the two of them as an organization. and thought out the details and what it would take to open and run um, you know, a, a residency this summer. And we did it in September for National Heritage, Latina Heritage Month. Uh, and we had an enormously successful, um, I mean, the, the number of applications was staggering. We didn't think we were gonna get, <laughs> we thought maybe if we get 10, but we got applications from all over the world. We got applications from Spain. We got applications from Puerto Rico. We got applications from Argentina, people really seeking community. Um, and so we are very pleased that it was, that was very successful. And we, of course, my intention is that we'll go on and it will happen every year and hopefully more than just one cohort. So I'm going to begin actively seeking funding for it so that it could be established and continue to happen. And the two partners are deeply committed to this, to, to, to making it work. Um, so that's a literary thing I'm doing, but it's not my own writing. In terms of my own writing, I've been working on a book about, um, Carlos, about farm workers. Um, in Eastern Washington. And I started this book before the pandemic doing a lot of field research. And of course that got truncated because of the pandemic. So this last weekend I, I've been traveling, I've continued to travel now that I can. So this past weekend I was back in Eastern Washington for field observations and the whole place was snowed in, which was okay. I mean, I got to see that aspect of the orchards, you know, just covered in snow. Um, but that's that's my new um, personal writing project. Thank you and congratulations on the um, that project. Amazing. Um, Carlos, uh, what are you working on or um, what's next? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm working on my autobiography. Uh, memoirs, autobiography. And the title of it uh, so far is, I wanted to become more than my father. And that brings me uh, lots of emotions, of course.
And so it's a, it's an explanation of how my becoming who I am changed my life. And so I, the early chapters, I identify the various positions that I had right down to the last one, which was uh, a professor at the University of Washington. But I was also a foreign service officer when I was in my late twenties and early thirties. I, uh, Claudia, I lived in Central America. I, uh, I was teaching Central America in the 1980s, Salvador, Guatemala, and so on, Nicaragua at the University of Washington. And so I, I'm basically writing to my own family, my own kids, my grand, great grandkids uh, who are already in their late teens and twenties. And so I sketch out the job that I had, including the foreign service jobs. So I, I lived in Chile. I met uh, Salvador Allende, for example, when he was uh, campaigning for the presidency. And so that changed me. I was no longer the kid that grew up in the barrio in San Fernando. No, no longer. And so I examined myself in terms of the changes, religiously and culturally, how did I change? What did I leave behind? Who did I hurt to become who I became? I go through all that. And so it's, it's very therapeutic. Uh, I think the first book uh, that I, the one that I was referring to earlier, that was very therapeutic because I was dealing with my parents. Why did my parents do what they did? Why did my mother do what she did? Why were my sisters hurt so much? That was very therapeutic. This autobiography is less so because I'm just dealing with myself and dealing with uh, the people that I loved over, over time. And so um, I... I'm glad I'm doing it and um, I hope uh, whoever reads it in my family and beyond my family <laughs> find it useful or interesting, <laughs> but that's, that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> Thank you. And Kathleen, um, what's next for you? It's so interesting to hear what everyone else is working on. <clears throat> it's a, uh... You all pick pretty tough topics, I think. Um, right now, I'm working on another historical novel. Um, it's about, it's set in 10th century Spain. It's about uh, one of the last Taifa kings when the Arabs were ruling Spain. Um, and his name was Al Mutabid ibn Abad. And he was such an amazing person. Uh, I thought he deserves. A whole novel just about himself because his life was a novel um so i've done a ton of research and i have maybe 80 pages done on that unfortunately i'm also writing another novel <laughs> which i don't recommend writing two novels at once um <clears throat> which is set in mexico uh and in the near future it's kind of a dystopia travel vlog let's call it that for now and it's called Los Voladores um, which is a group of people in Mexico several groups or troops who go from town to town and they fly they they put up a big pole and they tie their legs to it and they jump off and they fly and this has been done uh, since at least Aztec and time so um, that's my fun novel that I'm working on the other one is fairly complicated because these were real people and I want to make them real to uh, a current audience. And finally, um, a, book, a book that's already finished 
is the second novel that I wrote called uh, The Flower in the Skull, and that's coming out in May from Raven Chronicle Press. And that's based on the story of my mother's mother, who was uh, the illegitimate child of an Opata Indian woman in Sonora. And I did a lot of research for that, that actually turned out to be um, pretty happy in its outcome because I've met all these people who said, we're Opata, we're all still Opata. So here we are. Perfect, thank you. So I, we are out of time. Um, I want to say such a huge thank you to Catalina, Claudia, Kristen, Donna, Carlos, Kathleen. Thank you for your work. Thank you for adding your work to the archive. Um, and thank you for being with us here to, to talk about it and share it with us all. Um, we will send out a recording um, to all attendees and all who registered and we'll get the recording up on the Washington State Library's YouTube channel. Um, we will correct the um, automated captions and um, uh, also get the captions translated into Spanish to share online as well. So um, thank you all so much for being here again. And um, thank you for everyone who attended. Um, please feel free to share the recording with um, uh, friends and colleagues um, when we send it to you. Thank you all. <laughs>